What's going on on this fine, fine winter's evening? Ooh, I hope everyone's uh, having a good week. Good start to the week. Welcome back to the weekly stream. We're actually on time. We're actually uh, on the right day today. So it's a good start. It's a good way to kick the week off, I guess. Uh, but I hope everyone's had a good Monday so far. Hope everyone's ready for their Star Wars fix. Hope everyone's ready to check out what's been going on in that galaxy far, far away with a with a hint of Christmas music. Ish. Ish. We don't know how it'll go yet. We don't know how it'll go. <laughs> they might take the stream down because of the music. We'll see. I hope not. I hope not. Oh, so today we've got a pretty interesting one. We've got some updates on the Mandalorian season four, which I'm gonna, you know, go into a little bit detail with you guys. Obviously, there was a video about it earlier on, uh, but we're gonna go into a little bit more detail about that. What it could really mean going forwards for Disney Plus for the movies. What to expect? Is this going to affect Dave Filoni's movie? Is it going to affect Ahsoka season two? So many questions we have at this stage. Uh, of course, if it does come to the fruition, which it does look like it will be. Uh, so we've got a little bit to go through about The Mandalorian season four, Star Wars movies in general, uh, but also Rebel Moon. OK, now Rebel Moon's a bit of a strange one. It's got such a big fan base already, although it's not actually been released yet, but it's going to be released pretty soon. I mean, what is it? 11th of uh, December today. So I think it's like 10 days time, Rebel Moon drops. So we can look into that as well. Oh, and also, 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 very important, very important. IMDB have announced the top TV shows of 2023. Can you guess how many Star Wars shows are in that top 10? I think it's a top 10. Can you guess... How many Star Wars shows are in there? Well, we're going to take a look. We're going to warm up with that first of all. Get the old vocal cords moving up and down, as we like to do. Uh, Italian, what's up, my man? Um, yeah, I'm glad you can make it as well, buddy. Good to see you. Happy holidays to you, buddy. Happy holidays to you. As you can see, I'm having to wrap up warm. Having to wrap up warm, you know? It's not really that kind of stream, but check this out as well. That's one hell of a Christmas jumper, if I do say so myself. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hello, hello, Diana. How are you doing? How are you doing? Welcome. Welcome. That green badge is looking awfully good on you, I have to say. I have to say. Okay, so let's get the old vocal cords warmed up now we could either do that one of two ways we could either sing a song to kick things off or we can just go straight into the interest and stuff the reason that you guys are probably here for the most part maybe some other people have different <laughs> different reasons but uh, let's okay so we're gonna kick off the first article today we're gonna take a, a little uh mooch over to screen rant to kick things off now Oh, and I've actually got it loaded up twice. Look at that. Super prepared. Okay, so Ahsoka and The Mandalorian Season 3 shine on IMDb's top 10 shows of 2023. And I have to say, I was honestly quite surprised at this. I was honestly quite surprised. You know? Uh, I suppose it's when you're in like a certain area of the internet and you constantly are hearing people moan about Star Wars and how... It's not delivering here or it's not delivering that or the numbers ain't great for it uh, compared to other numbers. Well, overall, you know, if you look at all the shows from IMDb that have ranked in 2023, you've got two Star Wars shows out of two in the top 10, which is not bad going at all. It's definitely not bad going considering some of the big shows that have come out this year. So IMDb has officially announced their top 10 TV shows of 2023 with Ahsoka and The Mandalorian given their chance to shine. IMDb, for those of you that don't quite know, uh, the world's most popular source of information for movies and TV shows has officially ranked the various TV shows of the year using data from IMDb Pro, Movie Meter, and Star Meter rankings. Now, I don't actually know if this is actually taken into account for views or just audience ratings, what they've been reviewed, and from the critics as well. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we're coming up to the end of the year now. We might as well spread a bit of positivity, a bit of Christmas cheer. So... 2023 has been a massive year for TV, especially with Star Wars TV shows. 
Oh, this 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 beats a bit of a banger as well. Uh, I was listening to it before I came live. So, according to IMDb via CBR, the top ten TV shows 2023 are so ten. You got Gen V, whatever that is. Uh, nine, The Bear. Uh, I haven't watched that. Eight, Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso. I have not watched that either. Seven, The Fall of the House of Usher. I haven't watched that one. Six, One Piece. I haven't watched that one. If you guys have watched it, let me know what your favourite show is out of all of these. Um, five, The Mandalorian Season 3. I have watched that one. Four, Black Mirror. Nope. Three, Succession. Nope. <laughs> Mate, I'm quite abysmal at watching TV shows, aren't I? I need to really um, spend a couple of evenings in front of Netflix for a change. Uh, so Three, Succession. Haven't watched that. Uh, two, Ahsoka. Uh, yeah, I think I... I, think I I think I watched that one and uh, one The Last of Us and that's I, I did actually watch that so um, yeah so Ahsoka's coming in at number two The Mandalorian season three is coming in at number five which leads me to believe that this isn't based on views and how many people actually tuned in for the shows but rather than the um, the scores that they've been given the reviews that they've had through them uh, different sources there movie meter star meter the rest of it so Ahsoka coming in at two Mandalorian season three coming in at five expected i always expected ahsoka to come in higher than mando 3 a lot of people were disappointed by the mandalorian season 3 if you compare it to what we got in season 2 ahsoka came in whether you like ahsoka whether you hate ahsoka it definitely offered a new perspective on star wars in a way um it wasn't really the same type of show as the mandalorian uh it wasn't really the same type of star wars show we've had at all really um it was very much a dave filoni style and that really came through strong on ahsoka so it was a it was a bit of fresh air if you did like it you didn't like it doesn't really matter it was a bit different uh, lucasfilm will be particularly pleased to see two star wars tv shows in the top 10 i bet they will um the surprise though is that ahsoka ranks so highly this was believed to be something of a risk given it's a live action continuation of two animated star wars tv shows you have to think though the people that probably reviewed and rated ahsoka um so highly they must have had some sort of inkling of the story that was going on or they've obviously checked out clone wars rebels um but i mean regardless you can actually watch ahsoka contrary to popular belief you can actually sit down and watch ahsoka, uh, uh, ahsoka without actually digging in and, and knowing about the uh, the animation uh the stories that happened in animation um it's just it's a much better experience if you have watched rebels if you have watched clone wars so you really know who the who the hell most of these characters are but yeah so that's a bit of a positive that's a bit of a positive for star wars to kick things off today now there's been a change i wish i could do snoke's voice there's been there's been an awakening there's been a change have you felt it okay and we're going to get into that in a moment as well because that's obviously the big news is about the mandalorian season four um it's something that's really dominated conversations over the last couple of days since it dropped so we're going to get onto that next of all uh, but i have a question for you guys because i know the people that check out these streams your preferences on star wars your tastes what you like for star wars what you don't like for star wars does vary okay so out of the two shows mando season three and ahsoka which one did you prefer which one did you prefer and you're not allowed to say neither of them. If you had to pick one, if you didn't like any of them, it doesn't matter. If you had to pick one, which one would you prefer? Which one could you drag yourself to watch again if you had to? And if you loved them, then tell me your favourite. Hello, good sir. Your sweater collection is choice. Well, thank you, man. Thank you. <laughs> Still love that rebel cap. Oh, thanks, buddy. Thank you very much. I had to put it on because the hair was a bit manic today. I was walking around in the old woolly hat and um, you really flattened your hair down. I look a bit weird, so I had to put on the old hat. Um, I was disappointed that Ahsoka didn't receive any Golden Globe nominations. Did it not? Uh, to be honest with you, I had no idea um, about Golden Globe nominations and when they were coming out, when they were announced and the rest of it. So that's news to me. You filled me in there, Anthony, man. Uh, but yeah, it's a shame. But in this little sphere that we call Star Wars... Uh, it's obviously done pretty well and it's resonated with a lot of the audience, I think. So, what was this about? IMDB? Well, hopefully I've explained that for you now, Diana. 
<laughs> My man came with a fire sweater for the stream. Absolutely Italian. Or jumpers, as they say, across the pond. Yeah, well, we can call it sweaters. We can call it jumpers. It's a bit of a mixed bag. And here we've got people from all over the place for the most part. So, you know, I'm in one place. You guys are mostly in the States. We've got sublight out there in the sticks in New Zealand. Uh, we come from all over the place. Yeah, it's all good. It's all one universal language. Uh, to be honest, this is shocking to me. Mando 3 was not a good show. Mando 3 definitely wasn't as good as Season 2. Mando 3 definitely, in my opinion, wasn't as good as Ahsoka. Um, probably on par with The Book of Boba Fett, I think. Which, again, had a few stronger episodes. There was a couple of episodes in Mando 3 I liked. Maybe one or two that I thought, okay, great. Uh, we're really getting somewhere. Um, but yeah, I think it's mostly on par with The Book of Boba Fett in terms of how I felt about the overall show. Um Certainly not the strongest Star Wars offering on Disney Plus. Certainly not from The Mandalorian, or if you look at mostly other shows, Andor, Ahsoka. Um, I actually, uh, you know, I'd put the Kenobi series higher than Mando season three, without a doubt. Um, but with that being said, it's obviously just kind of demonstrating maybe what how people still hold Star Wars in in, in a fairly high regard, you know, despite what people will tell you you know despite what you'll read everywhere where star wars is literally down the toilet there is still something about star wars and you know it, it goes back to 1977 uh that still captures people's imagination just entering into that galaxy gives you a head start over some of the other shows so yeah i mean it's not the best, but it came in at fifth i mean it's beaten one piece the fall of the house of Usher. i mean to be honest i've never heard of the fall of the house of usher beating ted lasso which is surprising because I, I haven't watched it but a lot of people have been talking about that uh gen v as well another one that a lot of people are talking about that i've not watched so yeah it's definitely come in it's definitely come in and um it's obviously hit some people the right way but it's no surprise to me that ahsoka's coming in higher than that for sure yeah mando 3 should not be on that list i think play <laughs> kk paid someone off yeah maybe she did Maybe, yeah, or that, or that, or she, or she just paid someone off. Diana says a soaker out of those two, no question. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm of the opinion, I might be a little bit wrong here, Diana. I'm of the opinion that you weren't overly taken with a soaker, but, but you enjoyed bits of it. Am I right? I mean, because I remember when we were watching it and it was coming out, you was kind of, um, from, from my perspective, I might be wrong here, but you was kind of in that line of, you know, I, uh, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to let, a, you know, the show demonstrate that it's a good show. I'm not going to push it. I'm not going to really, you know, become obsessed with it or anything like that. So it's kind of like the show had to prove a point to you to stand up. But I mean, I could be wrong, but that's like the, the vibe I got from you in the streams over that period anyway. Um, I kind of like both, says Anthony. They fit two different tastes. I love the world building of Mando season three, but I love the groundbreaking storytelling of Ahsoka. Both bled into the other. Yeah, that's fair enough, Anthony. Um, my one criticism with The Mandalorian season three, and I don't know, it kind of felt different to me this time around as opposed to season one and season two. Whereas season one and season two, you have these episodes that aren't connected to the bigger story. You know, people call them filler. You know, people can call them, you know, whatever you want to call them. People can call them, um, you know, character building, whatnot. Uh, you had these episodes in all of the seasons of The Mandalorian, but it just felt like season three, when you had them episodes that didn't really connect to the larger story, they, were, they just weren't it for me. I mean, you had some episodes in there that really did get things going, especially when Gideon came in. Especially when you learn more about the uh, the Shadow Council and you've seen how they were still connected under behind the scenes, um, that was great. But then you had like the episodes where they dart off and they do something completely disconnected from the overall story. And I'm kind of sitting there thinking, okay, well let's let's get the story back on track a bit. And that was one of my um, big positives I actually took from Ahsoka. Ahsoka didn't do that whatsoever. Um, one of the things Ahsoka did very well was keep on track. You didn't really have to deviate to these side missions, go left, right, left, right, go 30 miles 
down that road before you can turn back on yourself and carry on going forwards. Um, so yeah, The Mandalorian Season 3, for me, it just didn't do them uh, in between episodes as well as the first two seasons. And of course, we didn't actually know who the big bad was uh, in The Mandalorian Season 3 until like, what was it, Episode 6 or something like that? Gideon came in really late. Very, very late. It's very much just a season of You've got Mando, you've got Grogu, the gang's back together, they're, they're gearing up for something, they've got a few little side missions to do here and there. Last minute, Gideon's back, oh no, everyone's scared. Um, take down Gideon, and uh, yeah, happily ever after. Move on to the next one. Yeah, I, I just think it wasn't up to the same level of standard as the, uh, the first two. But I hold optimism that season four will be better. If we even get a season four. <laughs> if we even get a season four. Um, Ahsoka felt like the, uh, the most like an absolute uh, follow-up to Return of the Jedi. Yeah, in terms of the overall story, I mean, it, it kind of would, I guess, you know, with Thrawn being the big bad after Return of the Jedi that we know of, unless someone else comes out of the woodwork. And obviously you get to the sequel trilogy, but we know there's so much of a story from Legends that's there to be told, you know. You go from Luke being this, uh, you know, Jedi Knight at the end of Return of the Jedi. Um, and then you catch up with him in The Force Awakens 30 odd years later. His life's been and gone at that point. Uh, all these crazy adventures he would have went on. We missed all of that. Go straight into the sequel. So yeah, we are really fleshing it out now. Hopefully, hopefully with these shows that are coming out. I actually think Book of Boba Fett has some stronger moments than Mando 3. What do you guys think? Um... Yeah, the best way I can gauge, in my opinion, and, uh, you know, because it's easy to get wrapped up when you're watching a show and when you come out of a show on, you know, what actually happened. The memorable moments from The Mandalorian Season 3 for me, if I think them back and then I think about uh, the book of Boba Fett, I mean, let's start with Boba Fett because that's the, uh, the oldest of the two seasons. The first episode of Boba Fett I really liked. Um, that just hit me with so much nostalgia. Because you're literally in that time period when you kick off the Book of Boba Fett or, or maybe like a 10 minutes in or something, have a flashback, I can't remember. But you're in that time period of Return of the Jedi, you know, when he's getting out of that Sarlacc pit. That was great, seeing how he escaped. Um, when he got his ship back, that was another highlight. The Luke episode, weirdly, was a highlight and, you know, it wasn't even Boba Fett. Uh, the Mando episode was a highlight. Um, the final was okay, you know, when he rode the Rancor, that was okay. Mando 3, I mean, what do we have really? Uh, the return to Mandalore, that was that was good. Um, all the stuff with the remnants I quite enjoyed. Uh, the Praetorian Guards, quite cool as well. Yeah, I'd probably say maybe with the Book of Boba Fett, probably about three or four episodes that I can actually remember and I think, you know what, that was actually quite a good episode. I'll probably rewatch some of them. Um, as opposed to The Mandalorian Season 3, there's probably about two, three episodes. Yeah, I have to agree with you there. I have to agree. I think Book of Boba Fett, for sure, has some more memorable, mo memorable moments, I should say. Second episode of Boba with the Tuscan was very uh, good. Yeah, so there were some moments with the Tuscans I enjoyed. Um, but... I mean, this is just my opinion, of course, but I actually preferred Boba in current time. I think after a while, the um, the flashbacks uh, to when he was in the sands on Tatooine and he was with the tribe, um, they got a bit long for me after a while. And I wanted to really catch up with what was happening in modern time with the syndicate, um, you know, with the, uh, with the, the mayor. Was it the mayor of Mos Espa? And all of the kind of current day situations that were happening i wanted to catch up with that a little bit more um i thought maybe the first couple of flashbacks or first couple of episodes with flashbacks in uh were great but then after a while it kind of just lost my interest a little bit every time we'd go into that back to tank um but there were some good tuscan moments i really liked that warrior tuscan that was teaching him how to fight with stick that was pretty cool uh mando season three suffered from kennedy's handiwork um, which adversely affected the beats and arcs of Mando. Um, 
Season 3, we lost an original Mando book too. Oh, no way. I didn't know we lost the book. Um, that's bad. I would have liked a Mando book. Yeah. Lovely, good to see you, man. Um, I loved Ahsoka's growth in the first few episodes, but hated the way that Mando felt like he regressed in growth from season two. I mean, that, that's another thing as well, isn't it? I mean, we had the Mandalorian season three, but it was very much Bo-Katan's season. And, you know, the people that actually worked on it openly admit that Bo-Katan was very much the Mandalorian this season. Katie Sackhoff said, you know, Din Djarin will always be the Mandalorian, but she had a time in the spotlight in season three. And here's the weird thing. I actually really like Bo-Katan as a character, and I really like Katie Sackhoff's portrayal as Bo-Katan in live action. I think it's fantastic, um, and I couldn't get enough of it. And I feel if they did that in Bo-Katan's own show, it would have been better. You know, I feel like The Mandalorian should have really been Din Djarin as the, uh, the front of that show, because that's what we had in the first two seasons. That's what we built up towards. Um... But that's nothing to do with Bo-Katan because I thought her portrayal, uh, Katie Sackhoff's portrayal and the character itself, fantastic. And if they dropped the Bo-Katan series, I'd be one of the first ones to watch it for sure. But I felt like The Mandalorian should have been a little bit more geared towards Din Djarin. A little bit more geared towards old Dinny boy. Um, just recently we watched the Mando episode with Bill Burr from season two. So good. There was nothing like that in season three. Yeah, no, there, there absolutely isn't. Um, season three is a bit of a strange one. You know, um, when they're trying to... When they go to the Imperial base on Navarro as well, that's another highlight uh, from the earlier seasons. I mean, it's always easy to think back at the season two final, but there's so many other cool episodes. The Ahsoka episode was great. The Boba Fett episode was great in season two. So much. Cobb Vanth in the first episode of season two. Cobb Vanth wearing Boba Fett's armor. You just look at that and you're like, wow, just take me away. I want to watch more. I agree, Dino. I love the Tuscan stuff in Bilba. I liked when he got high off that lizard. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty. Uh, that was pretty, pretty weird. But um, yeah, it was interesting. Um, the way that you see Tatooine transform into this ocean, as well, which of course it once was. Very interesting stuff to see that visually as well. Completely agree that that about Bo. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to, you know, Bo-Katan, fantastic character. I'd love to see her in her own show. Um, I think she should have her own show. You know, rebuilding Mandalore and all of it that comes with that as well. Um, but I just think the Mandalorian should be reserved a little bit for Din Djarin. But that's, that's just me. What do I know? What do I know? Okay. Should we get on to the big stuff? Should we get on to the big stuff? So I'm sure many of you are aware, and if you're not aware, then um, where have you been these last couple of days? Where have you been? We've had a big reveal-ish. It's already been revealed once, but then it got dismissed, and then it's back again. Okay? Weird story behind this. Weird, weird story behind this. This article is over on Bespin Bulletin. And you might be thinking, hang on, Deja Vu, we spoke about this for, uh, before. Mandalorian Season 4 reportedly being turned into a movie, next Star Wars film to be released. Okay. So let's get a little bit of background of what's actually <laughs> gone on here. Very strange. A few months ago, Making Star Wars came out and said, and they're very, they're very good, you know, with their Star Wars scoops. Like, I'd say Making Star Wars, Best in Bulletin, and the guy we're going to talk about in a moment, arguably the three best uh, scoopers, leakers, reporters on Star Wars there is when it comes to finding things out that aren't official. Um, so Making Star Wars came out a few months ago and said The Mandalorian Season 4, they're thinking about potentially putting it into a movie. Uh, I personally, when I heard that, I thought that, you know, if that's true, that does not sound like a good idea. I don't like the sound of a Mandalorian Season 4 being put into a movie. It's very much something that I feel like sits well on Disney+. Plus. When you're doing these seasons, you're telling these smaller stories, building up to the bigger event. Of course, put the bigger event on the big screen like they look to be doing with the Floney movie. 
but but season four as a movie mm, stick to the series format then jeff snyder okay the third person who i would say is up there you know probably them three are the best star wars uh journalists leakers scoopers whatever they would technically be known as jeff snyder came out and said actually no that's completely false effectively um, they're not considering putting the Mandalorian in season four as a movie. Okay, the sands on Tatooine continue to blow. A few months pass. The drought of strikes across the sand. Until recently, this article came up on the eighth, and I think the actual uh, podcast itself took place or dropped around the eighth or the seventh. <laughs> Jeff Snyder came out and said that actually, you know, although he heard this before and dismissed it. There is people now talking to him from the other side. The other side, I assume, would be Lucasfilm, telling them, actually, no, wait. Season four, being a movie, is very much a real thing. And what's more, it could be coming before we get the Rey New Jedi Order movie. Okay, so let's uh, let's dig in. Let's dig in. Knife and forks at the ready. So... Jeff Snyder of The Hot Mic has taken to his podcast to share an update on the next Star Wars movie, which might come as a shock to some readers, but not all that have been following the site in recent months. So before delving into what he's heard, Snyder shared on the latest episode of his podcast, The Hot Mic, which he co-hosts with John Rosher, that things in the film industry have changed, including plans due to the Writers Guild of America strike and sag Afra strike, and that this in particular has impacted Star Wars. Pre-Strike, Snyder reported that the Daisy Ridley-led Star Wars movie was set to be the next Star Wars film to be released and that Lucasfilm were eyeing an April 2024 start date uh, to get that film in. Um, Snyder, as well as the Hollywood trades and various insiders, all pointed towards the Ray movie being the first Star Wars movie to release since 2019. That is what um, Bestman Bulletin says they've been hearing themselves. However... Jeff Snyder is now hearing that the Ridley New Jedi Order movie is seemingly no longer the next Star Wars film looking to release in theatres. And he goes on to say, I think we've all been operating under the impression that the Daisy Ridley movie was going to be the next Star Wars movie. I know I certainly was. They announced like three movies and I was like, okay, well, the Daisy Ridley one is the furthest along, I think. As a director and all of that anyway, it doesn't sound like that may be the next one. So, I mean, that's quite odd, isn't it? Because you think back to Celebration, they announced the new Jedi Order movie, the Filoni movie, which is meant to be coming in 2026, December, and the Ray movie, they brought out Daisy Ridley. Now, this Ray movie, it isn't something that they're just kind of cooking up on the spot. They've been planning this for a few years. They had writers on there previously, um, Justin Britt Gibson and uh, someone else. <laughs> Can't remember his name. Uh, not, not too important now, though. They replaced them just before Celebration. Literally, we had no idea that they were being replaced before Celebration took place. And they were replaced by Stephen Knight, the uh, one of the writers for the Peaky Blinders show. So this, this story has been cooking up for a little while. They had a writer's room. Uh, I believe Dave Filoni was a part of it as well. Um, and it was of the vibes, okay? It was of the Lucasfilm vibes that this movie was going to happen one way or the other. You know, unlike the, the Paddy Jenkins Rogue Squadron movie, when that director, that writer leaves that project, that effectively falls apart and dies and, and disintegrates and you never see it again. This movie was never that. This movie was uh, cooked up inside the offices at Lucasfilm. People came on to work on the movie. And if that didn't work, they would go. The movie would remain to get someone else in. This movie was going to happen. It's going to come out um, one way or the other. <laughs> Or so they fall. So, the news that the Ridley film may come as a surprise given that just recently the film's lead Daisy Ridley herself, and this was literally like a couple of weeks ago, said that she believes a Star Wars film set to be directed by Shemaine Bay Chinoy was set to be the very next Star Wars movie released in theatres. The next Star Wars film is slated to be released is on May 22nd, 2026, so we're getting two in a year. Um, however, Snyder is now hearing from his Disney source that this is no longer the case and went on to share that the next Star Wars film to be released will actually be the fourth season of The Mandalorian, which is now taking shape as a movie instead of a season of TV, Snyder said. A couple of months ago, I shot this one down, as we uh, explained, that there were rumours that season four of The Mandalorian could be turned into a movie. I think at the time, I didn't think that was necessarily the case. However, that is now what I'm starting to hear. 
that the odds are in the project's favor. Whatever season four of The Mandalorian turns out to be, whoever is in it, what it turns out, whatever shape it takes, it is looking like it could be the next Star Wars movie. And that might be the thing that's announced before the end of the year. So yeah, in case you guys didn't know, Jeff Snyder said at the start of the month, so probably about two weeks ago, roughly now, or just over a week ago now, I guess, 10 days ago, um, that we're going to be getting a Star Wars announcement before the end of the year. Like a live action Star Wars movie announcement before the end of the year. He assumed uh, that it would be cast in for the Daisy Ridley, uh, you know, New Jedi Order movie. Uh, but apparently now it could be the announcement that the Mandalorian season four is going to the big screen. So before we go any further into this, I want to know initially what you guys think. Are you for a Mandalorian season four being a movie or do you prefer it? Do you prefer it staying as a season on Disney Plus and, you know, tell the stories to build up to that big event, which would be the Floney Thrawn heir to the Empire, as they're calling it, movie. One of the big questions I have in regards to this update is, does this mean that this Mandalorian season four movie is gonna take the May 2026 slot? Or is it going to become, is it gonna come before that date? Now, I wish I could give an answer on that. I honestly can't, although I have a sneaky suspicion it might be the case that the Ray movie is actually being pushed back. But if that's the case, where is the Ray movie going to? Is it going to take that December 2026 uh, spot away from Filoni? And then the uh, the Earthly Empire movie is going to be in 2027, 2028? Or is the, the Ray movie going to go around that and just jump straight into 27, you know, maybe 28 itself? That is one of the big questions. Although I think maybe we might have an answer as to why they've decided to push this into a movie and not a season. So let me pull up this next uh, thing. Let me pull up this next thing. I was going to say article. It's really not an article. This is something we spoke about last week, actually, if you guys remember. And it was in regards to the Jedi Order movie. Uh, it kind of uh, makes a little bit more sense now, I think. So this is over on Twitter. X, Star Wars Newsnet posted in reports that the the Ray movie was going to start filming in April. They said the rumor that production on the Days of Ridley-led Star Wars film is set to begin in April 2024 is incorrect. According to a source we contacted, the script is reportedly not ready yet. Now, let's pause it right there. We heard previously that Stephen Knight was expected to hand his script in, I believe, before Thanksgiving. So it was meant to be handed in by Thanksgiving. This post was obviously created and put out there after thanksgiving so that means one of two things either he's late putting the script in which is possible or he has put the script in but it's just not very good and in that case then we could expect perhaps another writer to come on and try and save that movie lucasfilm has been under pressure let's not forget from disney to put out a movie they haven't put one out since 2019 i mean the earliest one we're looking at at the moment 2026 slot at seven years, well, six and a half years without a movie. They're not liking that very much. So with the uh, the realisation that this Ray movie is not going to be ready by 2026, or it could be ready, but it's not going to be very good, potentially I don't want to rush things this time around, they thought, okay, well, what can we do instead? What have we got at our disposable... Our, dis uh, no. our disposable? Disposable? Disposable show series? At our disposal. What have we got at our disposal that we can put out there as a movie. And it actually legit be good because it's got some background to it, some work's been done on it. It's not something we're starting from ground zero. In comes John Favreau, in comes The Mandalorian season four. <laughs> so John Favreau back at Celebration already announced that he'd written the fourth season of The Mandalorian. So you don't have to worry about the story being written. It's already done, okay? And you don't have to worry too much about the cast, the crew. They're already on board for The Mandalorian season four. You know, a lot of them appeared in Mandalorian Season 3, Mandalorian Season 2, Mandalorian Season 1. Um, they might have a few extras to come in here or there. I mean, they could be tying in some more Ahsoka stuff um, into that Mandalorian movie as well. You might get a bit, little, uh, bit more Thrawn. Um, you might maybe catch up with what Ahsoka's doing on Peridia. I mean, they could very much put this as the um, Infinity War type movie. 
the build up to Endgame, the build up to the Heir to the Empire movie. That could very much act like this, um, where the fight begins, but it really heats up once we get to the Filoni movie. That's a possibility. That's definitely something uh, they could do. I mean, to be honest, as we was mentioning earlier on with episodes of The Mandalorian, kind of, you know, you get probably maybe four, five episodes a season that really push the story forwards, and you get like three or four episodes where it's a side mission. Mandalorian has always been like that, and season four is probably written to be like that as well. So all Favreau would have to do effectively is have a little reshuffle, take out some of these extra episodes and streamline it into a two-hour movie. Wouldn't take too much work at all. They're ready to shoot filming Mando pretty shortly. So that leads me to believe, well, possibly, you know, if everything's in place and all the ducks are in a line, then could we theoretically get this movie maybe in December 2025? There was a Star Wars slot for December 2025 a few years ago that kind of fizzled out. Could it still be alive? That's one question I've got. That's one question I've got. But let's see, let's see what you guys are saying on that. I remember from Mando season three with some huge birds, Jack Black and Moff Gideon yelling at my clothes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh man, that was a good one. Um, the way you put it, very well worded. Um, sounds like they ran out of written material to cut in screen time to make up for it. Um, my favorite part of these shows is the universe build enough that I would fear that a movie would limit that. I mean, yeah, I don't think there'd be too much, uh, you know, universe building in the movie. If I'm honest with you. But. I mean there's two sides to this coin as well. Because Lucasfilm. You know you get fed dribbits of information like this. And you think okay wow. Well they haven't really got their. Uh, <laughs> you know their house in order. They don't really know what they're doing. Okay. And you're probably quite right in thinking that. But then you go back and think of other things they've announced and think, oh, actually, maybe it kind of makes sense. Do you remember at Star Wars Celebration when they first announced the Filoni movie? And people were speculating, well, what about Jon Favreau? What's going on there? Why is he not involved in the movie? Why is he only an executive producer? Maybe it's because they were always planned. Maybe that plan was all the way back in uh, Celebration, that this could potentially be a movie and that Favreau's going to do it. So let Favreau have his movie, let Favreau have the part one of the Mando movie, and let Filoni finish it off with the part two. You know, maybe it's been in motion a little bit longer than we thought, but we're only catching up with it now. There's a lot going on there, uh, for sure, that we don't know about, that hasn't been spoken about yet, um, that we'll probably find out, you know, any time between now and, uh, and the summer. So it's definitely something to keep an eye on, but I, I do wonder, you know, what is it? What's really going on? Because it does seem very strange. It does seem very strange. Mando needs to be an action film like John Wick, not for the kiddies, bounty hunter. Uh, bounty hunting, gritty. Yeah, I agree. I mean, very, you know, more more like what season one was like, you know? Where he was like that bounty hunter out on the, out on the sticks. Um, you didn't know him. You didn't know where the hell he was for the most part. You didn't know what he was doing half the time. But he was pretty cool when he was doing it. Um, and he was a bit cold as well. He was a bit cold. He wasn't... I mean, you know, everyone loves, you know, the little, the little you know, Mando, Daddy Mando, Baby Grogu, Baby Yoda vibes. Um, you know, that's good. But then Jaren is at his coolest when he's not really talking. He's got his helmet on and he just does it. Just does it. You know, he doesn't speak about it. He doesn't flap around. He just does it. Um, that's when Dinzi is coolest. Um, that would be sick, Dinah. Either way, releasing a Mando related movie before a Ray movie is a good idea in my book. Is it? Is it? Now, the sequel trilogy, um, they all grossed over a billion dollars in the box office. Okay. The Mandalorian is the flagship show of Disney Plus. Don't let, don't let anyone tell you different. Don't let anyone say it's a Marvel show. It's Loki. Uh, the Mandalorian proved in season three that it does pull in more eyes than the Marvel shows. Mandalorian is very much the show for Disney+. Plus. They're moving it over to big screen. 
will that really capture the general audience? Because effectively, people that haven't watched The Mandalorian, you know, the first three seasons on Disney+, Plus, will they go and check out a movie that's technically already been, you know, it's halfway through already, it's halfway through the story? That's, that's the only query I have about it. That's the only concern that I potentially have. But also as well is the possibility that, you know, will we... You have to think, if they're going to make The Mandalorian a movie, it's going to have a movie budget, which means they could pull off some extraordinary things. You know, if you want a de-aged Harrison Ford, if you want a de-aged Mark Hamill, uh, and if you want Billy Lord to come in and, you know, be digitally created to look like a mum, a uh, Carrie Fisher, a young Princess Leia, uh, then they'll, they'll probably have the budget to do that if it becomes a movie, um, along with a load of other crazy stuff. So th there is that to it as well. There is a positive that, you know, people moan about the budgets you get for the streaming shows if they do put it into a movie then that for sure can can be an improvement on what we had in season three already um so there is that there is that there's another positive but it's very disney like isn't it <laughs> to put this into a movie and not actually give it the budget <laughs> to, to, to leave it on the budget make do with what you got um so overall my thoughts on that would be there is potential there, but it doesn't come without its risks. Because let's put it this way, if it does fail, if it does flop, if the Mandalorian movie comes out and it doesn't do very well, where does Star Wars really go from there? The Mandalorian is without doubt the best thing they've put out, universally liked, since I'd say Rogue One. You know, some of you might say since Revenge of the Sith. I would say for sure, you know, since Rogue One, I really like Rogue One. The Mandalorian is on par with it. If they pop it into the movie theaters and it doesn't perform, where are they going to go from there? What are they going to do? Like, will they ever get back to the heights they were at? That's probably what they'll be thinking. They'll probably learn the wrong lessons from it as well. Probably take away the wrong lessons from it. But you'd have to think with that big budget, they'll, they'll get Pedro Pascal in. That'll definitely draw some eyes in itself uh, with how famous he is at the moment of, you know, people loving... The Last of Us, all the other shows is in, he's an in-demand person. You're going to catch a Star Wars movie with Pedro Pascal as the lead, you know, and he's actually going to be there, not just for voiceovers. That'll draw in a crowd on its own. Mando movie, says Sublight. Uh, what's up, fam? It's been a while. How's it going? Just Star Wars. Yeah, all good, buddy. All good, buddy. Good to see you. Good to see you. Sublight's over on the beach right now, watching on his phone. <laughs> As I'm sitting here in this and and uh, the old Star Wars jumper. I, honestly, I'll show you again. This is my favorite jumper. And I, any excuse, any excuse to get out during December, I'll do it. Any excuse to get out during December. Okay. So, talking about December. Yes, it looks like it could shape up to be a big month for Star Wars. Looks like there's an announcement on the way somewhere. Probably going to be the Mando movie announcement. We'll have to see. But there's also something else coming in December. Something that I am looking forward to. And uh, there's a little article over on here. A nice short one. To whet our appetites. There will be a Rebel Moon video coming very soon. Very soon. I'm still trying to get the next Star Wars video ready. We should be good to go for tomorrow. All going well. The next Star Wars video. But there is something else coming up. That's Rebel Moon. Now, we've got a little article on here on the Men's Journal in regards to Rebel Moon. And it, it kind of talks about it being to do with Star Wars and, you know, the little attachments it has with that. So let's check this out real quick as well. So Rebel Moon breaks the rules of Star Wars, says Zack Snyder. Zack Snyder, um, upcoming, oh, Sna uh, Zack Snyder's upcoming Star Wars film, it should say, I believe, uh, breaks from the shackles of Star Wars. That's what the director said in a recent interview ahead of Rebel Moon, part one, A Child of Fire's release on Netflix on December 22. And apparently they're going to be dropping the trailer for um, part two at the end of part one because part two comes out in April. 
It, then this actually, I, I've skimmed through it. I haven't read the whole thing, but from what I'm seeing here, it sounds like much more than just uh, a knockoff to Star Wars, if that's maybe what you're thinking it could be. In a lot of ways, it's better for the movie that I ended up having to do it outside of the Star Wars universe because I think that there's a lot of rules that I would have had to have broken of Star Wars canon. Snyder tells IGN, He originally pitched his two-part sci-fi film Rebel Moon to Lucasfilm boss Kathleen Kennedy as a Star Wars trilogy around 2012. In the end, says Snyder, of the of the breakdown in negotiation, uh, negoti yeah. Of the breakdown in negotiations, the negotiations were short, probably. It would have been a cage I was living in. So in the end, it allowed me to be a lot more freaky. For instance, Snyder was free to create his own all-encompassing mythos across the two films. We had to back everything up. And this really reminds me of George Lucas when he was creating Star Wars. The kind of things he said about when he was writing the original Star Wars movie. The mythos that we were starting to create around the details of the world. And, uh, you know, even at the moment, I'm going through the, uh, the Star Wars archives book and it's all it's all in there. It's chock-a-block in there. It's like, for example, when uh, George Lucas dropped in in The Empire Strikes Back, that Luke's too old to begin his training. And then in the prequel trilogy, he has to explain what that really means. And he's coming up with all these, you know, basically playing the whole thing out even though it's not directly answered in the prequels so um yeah i mean this sounds very much like the process that george was taking behind creating a universe the mythos that we're all starting to create around the details of the world it was the details of the world that really started the process of building a real cohesive and mythically consistent reality it was difficult it was complicated and difficult so right there alone tells me that this isn't going to be some you know i can't ever say it's cheap because i think they spent a lot of money on this movie um but it isn't going to be some star wars knockoff by someone who just made a movie that's like star wars but you can't call it star wars because it's not disney um this is very much its own thing S similar beats to star wars but it's not just surface level storytelling it it's got layers to it it's got a world it's got a backstory uh, there's very much a background and there's a history there um so i think a lot of us star wars fans will absolutely dig that because one of the reasons we like star wars and it was mentioned earlier on one of the reasons that a lot of us love these shows is because of the universe the world building that happens within them i think rebel moon is very much going to follow that kind of um that kind of detail now one of those difficulties lay in constructing an entire new language some of the characters i mean you know us star wars fans love that sort of stuff one that has roots in russian if you had an aptitude towards a certain way of phrasing or sound shapes those make the language easier to speak of course so yeah it's very much going to be more than what we bargained for i believe in a good way um part two comes out april 19th 2024 okay and then part one they said was the 22nd of december so not too long to wait for that at all not too long to wait for that are you guys actually interested in Rebel Moon? That's what I want to know. Let's start a poll on that. I have to close my other poll. Start this one. You know, you guys have realised I'm not such a dinosaur of doing stuff on here now. Let's start a poll. Yes, please. I'd like to start a poll. Are you looking forward to Rebel Moon? I'd love to see uh, more about Dim's uh, Din's homeworld. Um, you could have flashbacks to that. Um, isn't that Clone Wars era? Yeah, Clone Wars era. Um, the moon of uh, Concordia, where he was... Oh, do you mean his a actual homeworld from the flashbacks? Yeah, that would have been... Um... Yeah, that would have been Clone Wars era. Separatist droids there, weren't they? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, yeah, that would... They could do flashbacks there. 
Whether they will or not, though, I'm not too sure because we haven't had any flashbacks back to when he was a child since the first season of The Mandalorian. So I don't know if they'll go down that route anymore, but it would be cool if they did. Um, perhaps they'll do it in perhaps an animation of some sort one day. Yeah, but sour taste of the sequels is still in people's mouths. Why would they show up for a race story? Mando is hotter right now. Yeah, that's very true. That is very true. They would have to... I mean, yeah. I mean... If there's a Star Wars movie coming out... I think... A lot of the general audience will still go to see it. I think a lot of the general audience... Now I might be wrong in thinking this, but I think a lot of the general audience, you know... If they... They might have watched the sequel trilogy and they might have thought, okay, well, it's not as good as, um, you know... The Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi... And then thought nothing more of it and probably haven't thought about star wars for about six years um <laughs> it's us star wars fans that sit there and stew on it and like how could you have done this to us um but for the you know the neutrals you know the um the you know the normal the normal folk we can call them that uh, they probably haven't really thought about star wars really apart from when it pops up on tv now and again for six years if they see that star wars movie's coming out if they see an advert for it i'd be like you know what yeah We'll take a trip down. We'll, we'll check it out. Um, even on the back of the sequel trilogy, I feel. But for sure, they're going to find it a lot harder than they did with The Force Awakens uh, to get people in there to watch it. Considering they set it up as the, you know, the end of the uh, the Skywalker saga uh, and made a big thing about that, only to continue on with someone who's just adopted the name of Rey Skywalker. Um, it's a bit strange. It's a bit strange. But I think people will check in still. Um, even if it's a Ray movie, um, but not as many. And there will definitely be some Star Wars fans out there that won't. Um, whereas, you know, if it's a Mando movie, they'd be more inclined to. Rebel Moon, kind of interested, but I wasn't a fan of his zombie movie on Netflix, so I'll check it out out of curiosity over what could have been. Uh, very well measured from Sublight. Not like we could expect any less from the, uh, the, the gentleman that he is. Um, Diana says Rebel Moon is a day one for me. Yeah, I'll be watching it on day one as well. Um, theatrical releases, they've got a few around the world, haven't they? I think there is actually one in New Zealand as well. Saying that, we'll probably see on Sub's Instagram that it'll be there day one as well. I bet you. I bet you Sublight will be there day one as well. So, I think that's pretty much everything I've done. Uh, in terms of uh, article wise but what i'll do is chill out anyway because i'm in no rush let's chill out let's kick it let's see what else is floating around on the uh interwebs for the old star wars is there anything you guys want to talk about Anything you want to mention, anything you want to chat about, anything at all. Oh, we've got uh, an update on Skeleton Crew, I believe. So apparently which is a bit bizarre considering Skeleton Crew is meant to be quite a while away, but the name of the lead character for Star Wars Skeleton Crew. So we had the little Max Rebo species alien, didn't we, last week, and now we've got the lead. So, maker Star Wars via the subreddit Star Wars News shared details on another character for Skeleton Crew, the live-action series created by Spider-Man's homecoming team of John Watts and Christopher Ford. I decided to share my Neil report, and I know some of you like that, Neil. <laughs> Um, who chopped one of Fury's sabers? I know you did, sub. <laughs> I know you did. Um, a Christmas present, right? <laughs> a special Christmas present for someone special. Um, I, des I decided to share my Neil report. You've distracted me now, man. Uh, and I know a lot of you like the name Neil. Um, earlier this week due to making Star Wars plan to share some details on what he knew of the Skeleton Crew projects. My article was somewhat thin on details outside of the Neil name and that's why I waited so long to even do a report on it because I want to couple it with more details but that didn't happen. So 
Maker Star Wars, however, has shared a name from the series, Wim. Wim. Which he believes is played by Ravi Kabot uh, Conyers. Maker Star Wars via Reddit added that he believes Wim to be the lead of the series and that he is the Mickey of the skeleton crew, Mickey being a reference to the character played by Sean Austin in The Goonies, a film that is inspired, that has inspired skeleton crew. I've been thinking as well, you know, I often, you know, bridge off into imaginary worlds and lands and what if scenarios in my head because i am at the moment you know like getting through um stranger things right massively enjoying it i've never watched it before oh, that's a lie i watched season one before but then I, I just i didn't watch any more after that for some reason um but i've watched it from the start and i'm now like halfway through season three so I, i'm getting through it they're all like almost an hour long episodes it seems Sean Levy, who's directing a Star Wars movie, um, is one of the people behind Stranger Things. I can't help but think he should be the man for Skeleton Crew. I can't help but think he should be the man for Skeleton Crew. I think that's a missed opportunity. And it kind of got me thinking as well, other missed opportunities. So for example, Tony Gilroy would have probably been a better choice to have on the sequel trilogy, I believe. Whereas Ryan Johnson may have been a fine choice for Rogue One, funnily enough. You know, that kind of movie that has a beginning, that has an end. So whereas he tried to end the sequel trilogy with The Last Jedi, and that didn't quite happen because there was always another movie coming out. I reckon he would have worked better on a uh, standalone project like Rogue One or Solo. Um, and I think this is another situation where, you know, I think they're missing a beat putting Sean Levy on this type of show. But, you know, we move. We move. So, back in April, a trailer for Skeleton Crew was debuted at a Star Wars celebration during the Lucasfilm Showcase, which I got to witness firsthand in the room. Since that time, the trailer has found its ways online various times and can still be found online if fans look hard enough, but I won't be linking it here. Yep, honestly, the trailer is online, but the quality of the version that's on there now is not really worth watching. Not really worth watching, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought, Sub. Well, you never know, you know. We won't get into that type of conversation here, Sub. Like, we'll keep it, you know, uh, PG for the most part, but... It is Christmas after all. And maybe if there's mistletoe involved, who knows? Uh, 12.50, wow. That is a lot. You know, I've always wanted to, and I'm, I'm toying with the idea as well, if I get the time to do it. Is to, um, no, no, not, not create my own saber, um, but to actually buy one of the empty saber hills. You can pick them up for about uh, $150 um, US dollars empty saber hilt nothing in it just a shell effectively um, yeah I've got this one over here it's not empty but you'll get the idea so I've got this one here and uh, it'd be empty and then you buy like the boards the sound boards and, and the rest of it and you effectively just put it together uh, you get your blade um, I, I don't know how the colours work. You put your own sound fonts on there and the rest of it. You basically just build your lightsaber. I think I'd pretty much feel like a Jedi if I did that. Um, so I'm thinking of maybe getting a bit by bit. Start with the, uh, you know, the actual saber itself and then do all the electrics and that afterwards. Probably take me a while, but I thought it'd be quite a cool little uh, series we could start off on the streams. I just watched Dial of Destiny, Indiana Jones. What would your opinion be on a time travel jump that puts a live action indie cameo um, in Star Wars? Um, yeah, no, wouldn't be for me, man. Wouldn't be for me. Uh, I think they they play off. Well, I think Indiana Jones plays off Star Wars very well um, and vice versa. Like you look at Andor, yeah, the Sankari stones in Andor. Um, obviously indie you have your little star wars bits and pieces in there as well 
but keep them separate because you know it'd be pretty weird having uh, Indiana Jones meet Han Solo. That would, that would that would be that'd be pretty strange. Uh, but yeah. Uh, keep uh, Ruin Johnson away from Star Wars, says Diana. Agree with you, Stranger Things is good, but so was that Spider movie, good tone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Spider-Man, you know, the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies are my... You know, I don't know if they're my favourite. They might actually be my favourite Spider-Man movies overall. So, yeah, he'll do a good job of it for sure, but I have the idea that maybe they could be utilised more on a different project. Have you seen the first real saber from uh, for sale from Hacksmith? Little saber looks fun. No, I haven't. I'm going to check that out now. I've seen um, him make the prototype sabers, um, which look pretty cool with, a, with the, the backpack on there and stuff like that. Let me see if I can find it. So I take it as a YouTube video advertising it. I didn't know Hacksmith was still doing it himself. I thought he was taking some time away. No. No, he's got a video an hour ago. My team all right, let's get this up so we can all watch it. Thank you very much, sub. Essentially an overpowered lighter. Right. I want it. Get me the overpowered lighter. Let me know if you can hear it okay in a moment. I make the most realistic and functional lightsabers the world has ever seen. And at 4,500 degrees, they can cut through almost anything. But I believe lightsabers aren't just for Jedi. Hello there. Or Nobody actually looks like Obi-Wan. Or the dark side. Join me. We're making real lightsabers that you can buy. But not these ones. You guys aren't ready for that yet. But your kids are going to love them. Until then, our brand new mini sabers are now available at Hacksmith.store in stock to ship complete with two brand new colors for good and evil i spent the past three years developing these from the ground up now why did i do that well it's a fantastic product that i know you're gonna love but more importantly mini sabers are the key to building real life full-size functional lightsabers without any cords or hoses and you guys are gonna make it happen we're gonna live in a world where lightsabers are real all thanks to you and right now, you can actually snag a mini saber for 25% off if you buy it through the YouTube shopping shelf below this video. But more on that later. Thanks to our sponsor, YouTube Shopping. Here at Hacksmith Engineering, how much are they? We're the world leaders in lightsaber technology. No I might actually start close. smoking to have one of them. <laughs> we're pretty much the only ones working on real lightsabers. But anyway, we aren't satisfied with what we've made, and we won't be satisfied until we've made the real thing. We're taking our big backpack-powered proto lightsaber and shrinking it all the way down into just a hilt. Now the key to doing this is liquid oxygen. That's because in a liquid form, you can store over 800 times the volume as a gas. That means we can go from a tank this big to one this small built right into the hilt. No cords, no hoses, just a hilt. A real working lightsaber. I can't tell you guys how amazing this design is gonna be. The problem is liquid no oxygen way. is cryogenic and using it is quite literally rocket science. Not to mention super, super dangerous. So. Let's play with some liquid oxygen. Sorry guys, but I'm gonna I'm gonna check this out for a moment. <laughs> well, I haven't watched this channel in a while. If we go down this route, this lightsaber will essentially be a pipe bomb if we design it or even assemble it wrong. I'll let Bogdan explain. There's no way I'd be able to get that shipped over to the UK. If I ordered one, there's no way that sends to the UK. It's just above absolute zero. It can be extremely explosive, reactive, and it'll boil off, which can cause things to rupture if it's not properly vented. Could you imagine trying to come through customs with that? It's all around super dangerous and really difficult to use. In order to safely handle liquid oxygen and continue lightsaber development, we needed a massive infrastructure upgrade here at Herc. We needed to build a class 100 clean room, which is cleaner than an operating theater for open heart surgery. You see, a single fingerprint on the inside of one of our parts can cause the entire lightsaber to explode. That's enough fuel that during a flash fill, it'll ignite. And once things are burning in liquid oxygen, well, 
they burn really fast. Anything that's normally flammable in air is explosive in liquid oxygen. And things that aren't flammable, like steel, is flammable in oxygen. Now having oxygen is great if we want to burn through steel, for example, and cut like a real lightsaber. But it's not so great if the entire lightsaber handle catches on fire while I'm holding it. So a single dust particle, no, a metal good. chip, or even an eyelash can cause the entire lightsaber to become a bomb. That's so we have to take it very seriously. It's all around super dangerous and no really way. difficult to use, which makes R&D extremely expensive. And that's why we launched a crowdfunding campaign last May when we released the Mini Saber as a pre-order. The idea was simple. Buy a Mini Saber and support the next generation of real-life lightsaber development. And it worked. We smashed our funding goal in just over a month and have been able to make significant progress. Huge thank you to everyone who pre-ordered a Mini Saber. We couldn't wow. have done this without you. It took much longer than expected to start production. But we wanted to make sure these Mini Sabers were perfect. There were some quality control issues, delays from the manufacturer, and shipping issues at the port. You know, guys, that's a great idea, actually. I might do that, you know. Um, if you guys buy loads of the hats, then eventually I would like to make the hats with the flappy bits. Um, we'll make a go. We'll make a go. But last month, we received our entire shipping container full of mini sabers, and we were so excited. After months and months of waiting, they were here. Not cool. Like, natural reaction. What? Wow. You can bet that I would. I would wear that. Like on on my. I'd clip it on and I would go out. In Texas. And I'd just drop the opus Star Wars lines in the shopping center. The shipping couriers had to send entire trucks just for order pickups. We even made friends with the drivers. And no coat like a true Canadian. All right, how is this? I could pass as a brother for those two guys. Um, <laughs> I don't see the similarities myself, but maybe. I don't know. Maybe they are. Maybe they are. My hand got sore from signing so many boxes, but it was all worth it to see people getting our new invention in their hands and absolutely loving it. Thanks, guys. I'm so excited to share that we have now shipped all 8,500 pre-orders as of last week, which means mini savers are now in stock and ready to ship immediately at Hacksmith.store, complete with two new versions for both the light side of the force and the dark. The color changers are probably my favorite part of the design. Thanks to the fundraising campaign, Bogdan has been working full-time on continued lightsaber development. He's made some amazing progress, and as a reward for our backers, everyone who pre-ordered a mini-saber and anyone who orders one going forwards, you get to see our behind-the-scenes lightsaber update videos and access to our backer-exclusive Discord channel, as well as a Hacksmith Challenge coin to prove you helped develop the world's first real lightsaber. And this, this is just the beginning. The funds from every mini-saber sale go right back into lightsaber development. We already have preliminary designs for future iterations we're tentatively calling the Rock chemistry to change the color of the flame. Look at that! Oh, my eyes. I'll let Ian explain. Oh, that's bright. <laughs> Changing the flame color is relatively simple chemistry, and there's actually already... Nice. Nice, but I'm going to check out and see how much they are. Don't mind me, guys. Don't mind me. Sounds good. Oh, nice. Happy days. The little ones use butane, ship empty, do it. <laughs> you just like me spending money, sub, that's what it is. Um, but no, I um, I highly doubt that they would ever ship one of them, you know, ones with rocket fuel or whatever is inside of it. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever get that over to the UK. Um, let's check Let's check out, let's see if they've got a link on here for their store. Mini Saber Bundle. Oh, I need I need two hundred dollars. Oh, so they have a store in the UK for these mini sabers. Yeah, look. That's it nice to be fair. Oh, 
Oh, okay. So it's just a random, random old website. <laughs> no worries. Um, <clears throat> Toby's the best spider yet, but best comic book movie is either X Men X Two or The Batman. Okay. Okay. Yeah. See, I'm not like um, I've never been a big uh, Marvel comic book fan. I've not really ever got an in well i've never really read them to be honest with you but i do like watching the mcu i did you know probably up to end game then i stopped watching largely and then i've came in for some of the ones i knew like i, I watched the uh, the last four movie um i watched spider-man uh, the last spider-man movie as well um but i've watched the original spider-man i can't comment if the x-men x2 or the batman or anything because i haven't actually watched them or i might have but just not remembered maybe years ago um maybe i need to go for a little history lesson into uh into batman and all of that <laughs> yeah i mean is this music not sad enough sub i mean this is like the christmas year i could find i mean it was either going to be this or he was going to be rocking out to michael buble for an hour and a bit um and i thought maybe that might detract it might detract from the purpose of the stream if we're just having fun chilling with Buble. So I had to settle for the old. And plus, I don't want Michael Buble clawing, clawing at the channel to get you know, to get any scraps he can for me playing the music. Um, highly recommend the Batman. Patterson killed it. Okie dokes. I'll have to check it out. I watched Batman v Superman. Um, and I watched the uh, Zack Snyder cut as well. But other than that, I've really largely been out of it. To be honest with you, it's not really something that's ever really taken my uh, my, my interest. But it's something that I could definitely sit down and watch and try out. Uh, because to be honest with you, I'm awful at things like that. I mean, look, I'm only just watching such Stranger Things, so I can definitely do with a uh, a crash course in it. I think. Definitely. All right, guys. Well, I think. Yeah, Michael Bublé coming for the Just Star Wars Millions. Absolutely, man. I mean, I'm going to have to sell all this equipment, all this gear, the lights you can see in the background. Um, the Just Star Wars sign there, that'll have to go. Um, it will be stripped. You know, the uh, fairy lights on the mic, headphones, uh, the chair will be gone. You know, I'll be sitting on a stool. Um, very uncomfortable. Might even be sitting on the floor. Computer's gone. Uh, I'll be literally just streaming on my phone. But there's one thing I promise. Even just streaming on the phone, out of spite, I will still be playing Michael Bublé in the background. Up until he comes and takes the phone as well, of course. But we're going to leave it here, guys. Uh, thanks for chilling. Thanks for chatting. In the uh, next few days, I'm going to go and get around to arranging um some sort of a christmas party stream as well so yeah i'm gonna arrange some sort of christmas party stream in the next few days hopefully and uh, i'll keep you guys informed and up to date on what to expect from that what you need to wear uh, what you need to bring i.e drinks and uh, the rest of it so it should be fun uh diana i'm on the same page as you got a head out so yeah happy holidays if i don't see you before but uh there's a good chance well i definitely will be streaming before the holidays um actually kick in so i'll see you guys later uh thanks for hanging out everyone much love great to have you all in as always um <laughs> thanks for another year of laugh with these streams no anytime man anytime i mean to be honest with you i think at the moment it's kind of chilled kind of mellow um, things are just kind of just plodding along at the minute. Um, but it's because, well, one, it's because there's, you know, there's no current Star Wars coming out. So I'm kind of, you know, reassessing on what we're doing going forwards at the moment. Um, and I'm kind of working on a lot behind the scenes. Um, so things are a little bit quieter. Things are a little bit, uh, you know, more relaxed at the time being. But then the behind the scenes bits will come out sooner rather than later and you, it'll all make sense and you'll be like oh okay so it's, you know this is actually good i like it it's all worth it in the end um blood sweat and tears and um, maybe on the weekend a few beers who knows uh, but we'll leave it there guys i'll catch you in the next one much love 
I will be on next Monday. I will be on next Monday for sure. I'll see you then. May the force be with you. 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 You guys still there? So I'm thinking for the Christmas party stream, we could definitely get some games, some quizzes on the go. Um, general party games like that. We'd all have to wear a Christmas hat, of course. Um, have a few drinks. Have a laugh. We won't be able to get too, you know too excited with it though because because you know technically i will be live so um i i, you know, I don't want to make any more of a fool of myself on the internet i already do so don't encourage me guys maybe even get a guest or two on as well maybe three we'll see i'll see what i can arrange much love, everyone. May the force be with you, always.